All right. So I am Liz McGuire. I am the Director of Commercial Operations at Abbott Structural Heart. I wanted to thank everybody for joining us. Really what this is, it's a series and it's a series that's really started by a, a passionate team that we have here at Abbott as well as physicians. And you see two of them here today, Dr. Giwala and Dr. Rinaldi, and I'll have pass it off to Kara in a second. But it's a continuum. Um, we've started this because it's a passion project of ours. We want to make sure that we offer educational programs that all of you would like um, as fellows and early career physicians and make sure that we're delivering content that you would like. And so when we had our event last year, one of the um, feedback that we got that we wanted more case complexity. We wanted to hear about the differences and how we treat different patients and the tips and tricks that the physicians and experts that you have here on the panel do. And so that's what we're offering today. But we really are committed to this program and committed to make it go out throughout the year. So feedback from all of you after this is really crucial because we're going to develop content that all of you want to hear. So it's really a, a, a gift that we want to give to you. Um, and deliver content that's going to be valuable for you. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kara Hatcher. Thank you very much, Liz. My name is Kara Hatcher. I am the Director of Commercial Initiatives here at Abbott Structural Heart and very, very uh, pleased to be here this afternoon. Uh, we do want to make sure that we uh, uh, share that the content in this call represents the beliefs of the speakers and do not necessarily represent the view of Abbott. Information presented is consistent with applicable FDA guidelines. Speakers are presenting at the request and on the behalf of Abbott. Honoraria is being provided. The meeting is not intended for CEU credits. Support for the program is provided by Abbott. Tonight, we have two phenomenal speakers to deliver the content for this afternoon. Dr. Neil Giwala, is a structural interventional cardiologist at Pima Heart in Arizona. Dr. Giwala graduated from medical school at the University of Missouri at Kansas City and completed his residency at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and fellowship at Brown University in Henry Ford Hospital. Dr. Giwala currently serves on the board of directors of his national group, US Heart and Vascular. We also have Dr. Michael Rinaldi. He is a cardiologist in Charlotte, North Carolina, and is affiliated with multiple hospitals in the area, including Atrium Health, Pineville, and Atrium Health Carolinas Medical Center. He received his medical degree from Weill Cornell Med Medicine and has been in practice for more than 20 years. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Ronaldi, who will start off our presentation for this afternoon. Hopefully you can see my screen here and I'll go into slideshow uh, from the beginning. Everybody can see it? We're good? Yes. All right, mm -hmm. okay, good. So I thought um, what I would do is talk a little bit about complications. And I have over the last 18 years of experience with Mitral Clip accumulated some complications. And I'd like to share those with you uh, so that you don't have to learn it the way that I learned it. And, um, and um, perhaps we can you know, share experience. And, and this is um, gonna be more like, a, here's the complication and here's what, what, you know, how to avoid it and what to do about it rather than a case-based presentation. But Neil's gonna show more of a case-based presentation. I actually like the case-based way better, but I thought that setting up uh, the discussion about specific cases by just showing a, a, a systematic way of looking at the procedure made the most sense uh, as a setup. So um, with that, um, I'm gonna start with uh, transeptal complications. Um, so, you know, the first step of the procedure is, is, uh, is getting a good transeptal. And I have uh, had transeptal complications in my life. Um, you know, they should be rare with, with modern day imaging and, and, uh, and current transeptal te techniques, but, but it'll happen. And, um, and the key thing is that I learned the hard way is if you, um, if you have like a little pericardial effusion after a procedure, yeah, fine, do a tap and, and, and that's, you know, maybe some micro perforation. But if you poke a hole, uh, giving protamine and hoping for the best is not generally going to work. Uh, you made a big hole and it's not going to close on its own. And in fact, if you, uh, if you reverse it with protamine, uh, then you end up not just with blood in the pericardium, but clot in the pericardium, which is much harder to deal with. So first thing is, uh, if you make an effusion by poking a hole, um, don't give protamine. That's counterintuitive. I was taught, uh, you know, 
a long time ago uh, to get protamine. That's wrong. Uh, second, call surgery right now because it takes them a while to get to the OR. And if you made a hole in, in the pericardium, it's pro, uh, in pericardium, it, you're, pro, you're probably going to have to go to the OR. So call them now. And third, you know, stabilize the patient, get a drain in, and you can uh, put a three-way stopcock and connect to a venous sheath, and then just use a use a you know 60 cc syringe and suck out of the pericardium, turn the stopcock, put it into the femoral vein so you don't lose so much blood while you're waiting to go to the OR. Um, you know, sometimes it'll slow down its own. I've actually seen people where that worked, but it's actually never worked for me. And the couple times that I've ever had to do this, I've gone to the operating room. So just it's just know that. Um, second, um, once you've done your transeptal or you're about to do your transeptal, a guide, like everything in interventional cardiology, guide is everything. If you don't start out with a good guide, you're going to struggle for the rest of the procedure. So, you know, you want to be posterior, right? You want to be posterior so you can get enough height to the valve and take the time that it requires to do that. But also, don't be too superior. Um, in fact, probably mid septum to low in the septum is is preferable because if you if you stick high and sometimes it skates up high, you know you think you're mid septum and it, and and it, and it um, maneuvers up a superior and you're more superior than you think. And you can see here this is a a superior stick, a total mistake. If you take that and put your sheet through it, uh, you know put your guide through it, then you're going to end up with an aorta hugger. And uh, and and it's better if you recognize this. If you just put your, you know, bailiff sheath across, take it out and re-stick lower. Don't accept a, a lousy stick because you, you know, because of inertia. Um, and uh, and so, um, you know, this is what an aorta hugger looks like if you stick too superior. Um, so it ends up hugging the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve there, and that makes it much harder to grab the anterior and posterior leaflet simultaneously. Now, the way to manage that, if you happen to do it, is you put plus knob on. Plus knob moves you. Uh, you know, towards the annular plane, but you do lose some height when you do that uh, and you move a little bit medial and it's better just get a good stick from the beginning. Now, the way to fix it though, is if you end up with an aorta hugger, which you will inevitably in your career, is to put plus knob on it so, to stand you up in that Z plane. But again, uh, guide is everything. Um, and then uh, the next is once you've made your hole, uh, at the end of the case, uh, generally you do not have to close it. Uh, there are some people who close these things, but uh, there's even a randomized trial that suggests uh, no benefit in closing the, the hole. Um, it's never good to be completely dogmatic. If you have uh, a, a right to left shunt at the end of the procedure, or you have a big TR jet that's pointing right at the hole and causing shunting, that's a different story. And uh, it's probably better to close it with a Gore device uh, because they're easier to go through again if you need to. But, but in general, uh, I've probably closed a couple of transeptal punctures in my entire career, and they were um, from, you know, injury to the septum. It's not, not necessary for most cases. Next is, um, is, is developing air in your guide. So it's pretty uncommon to develop air in your guide, but the one way that you can do it is once you've done your transeptal and you point and you, uh, you've got your guide across the septum, the guide will um, tend to run posterior in the atrium because you, you're pointing it towards the pulmonary vein. And when you pull your uh, dilator and wire back, if you've got too much posterior torque in it, on it, it will fall into the posterior wall of the atrium, and then it'll create suction when you pull out your, your dilator. And if that happens, the, the, um, the hemostatic valve on the guide is not really that competent, and it'll allow air to get sucked into the guide. If you see air get sucked into the guide, you're going to have an air embolism. No matter how fast you suck it out, um, every time that's happened to me, the patients developed ST elevations, and uh, and then you give them high flow oxygen and and do the best. In fact, here's a nice case where I actually had a little chunk of of something in the atrium. I couldn't figure out what it was, and I was like, oh boy, that's air, and so I sucked it out. Um, but best not to do that. So the key thing to avoid is is don't it is when you take out your dilator and wire, make sure that you are uh, that you clock the guide, that you anterior torque the guide, so you come off the posterior wall and that you visualize the tip of the guide and that it isn't up against tissue. Um, and if you do get air in the guide, the most important thing you can do is take the guide out of the stabilizer and put it below the level of the patient. That's counterintuitive. I always thought it, like you want air to rise, so you, ra you raise it up, but it turns out the way the physics work on the device is you, put, you bring the uh, guide box below the level of the patient and suck, and that will get more of the air out of the guide. So 
Best, best to avoid it in the first place, but if it does happen, drop the guide block guide box below the level of the patient when you suck the air out. Um, next, uh, so you've got your, your clip into the atrium and you're, and you're grasping. Um, one of the most important things to do when you're grasping is make sure your arms are truly perpendicular to line of coaptation. And I think that is really important to focus on this, to spend a lot of time on it. Because first, if you can't grasp both leaflets simultaneously, the first nine out of 10 things is your arm angles are off and you're throwing air balls because you're, you're not you know, perpendicular to that line of coaptation, so you're sliding by the leaflets. But importantly, if you grasp and you're not truly perpendicular, you may get some MR reduction, but you won't get as good MR reduction and you may distort the valve, pinwheeling the valve, causing gradients or new jets elsewhere, or just simply not get as good MR reduction. Here's a nice example. So on the left, in a transgastric view, now you don't have to use transgastric to align your arms, but if you really want to know, transgastric has the best resolution over 3D above the valve, um, but you know whatever your imager is comfortable with. But look, the, I'm not really truly perpendicular line of coaptation. I was able to grab the leaflets together and I had MR reduction, but it's not great, it's not great. So I released and, and reoriented the arms and same patient, same grasp, um, it, it, it's just much better MR reduction. So spend a lot of time on arm orientation and remember that, the, that you know, watch it on fluoroscopy as it goes into the ventricle because you wanna wanna make sure it spins. Uh, and if you're not sure, and if you're, if you're, if you're causing new, weird gradients or new jets elsewhere in the valve, or if you're not satisfied with the MR reduction and you think it should be better than it is, First thing to do is check your arm angles. It's really important. Um, the next question, the next thing is um, is leaflet injury. So it's really rare to cause leaflet injury. All of these things are not common. Everybody knows clip is really safe. That's one of the best things about clip is it's a pretty calm uh, procedure. It's relatively safe, uh, but but you know things can happen anywhere. And we're talking about these complications. So leaflet perforation can happen. When does that happen? So if you if you, especially if you use long arm clips. If you pull up in, in, you know, atrially, pull really up hard, and then you close it without giving back the, uh, the, the slack into the left ventricle, then you put a lot of tension at the tip of the leaflets, which is at, I mean, at the tip of the clip arms, which is at the base of the leaflets, and that can actually perforate. And see, you can see a lot of flow here. That's not where that flow should be. This is uh, the, this is the, um, this is, you know, this is a, a um, I guess the posterior leaflet, and there's flow. Uh, where where there shouldn't be. This is, uh, you know, to the side of the clip. There shouldn't be any flow there. If it's going to be flow, it should be in the center, but not, not at the side. So I perforated a leaflet. That's a difficult problem to fix. In fact, it is largely unfixable. So you don't want to, you don't want to do that. And, um, and so, uh, so be careful when you're closing clips to give a little slack back into the ventricle as you're closing. It doesn't require a lot, just, just enough to take the upward tension off because when you close that clip, you don't want the tip, the, the tips of the of the clip arms to be above the level of the annulus. That's when you're going to injure the leaflet. So um, make sure it's below the level of the annulus. Cordal entanglement, that absolutely can happen. It's more likely to if when you work in the commissures or if you have calcified cords, it can result in the clip getting stuck or, or it can lead to cordal rupture. The key thing is to avoid rotating the arms in the ventricle more than 10 to 20 degrees, especially. You know, you can do it a little more than that in the center of the valve, but if you're in the commissures, um, you don't want to do that, especially if you feel like you're interacting with cords. Um, and you can watch, you know, how the the the, the clip delivery system reacts as you uh, change uh, positions in the ventricle, because if if you're pushing in or pulling out and it, and uh, and it fulcrums, then you know you're interacting with cords even if you can't see them. And you definitely don't want to spin in the ventricle more than you know 10 to 20 degrees. If you have to really change the arm angles. Just invert and come out and fix it in the atrium. And, and there are tactile and visual warning signs. And if it happens, if you're stuck, invert. Uh, you could cycle the grippers if you have to. But I think in general, if you invert and you and you come off of whichever leaflet that you're stuck to or, or at whichever cord you're stuck to by, by torquing the other direction, generally you'll free up. And if you did something like turn the, the clip in the ventricle, just undo what you did. So um, here's a, a nice example of when you're stuck on, on cords and you don't really sort of perceive it. And I, I looked for a while to find an example of this. This is a good example. So it's hard to know that you're stuck on a, uh, on a cord because I wasn't thick. I, I was coming up and I was grasping, 
but I couldn't get the clip to come up and touch the leaflets. And you can see the guide is actually pulling down towards the annulus and the clip is pulling up and it's never meeting the leaflets. And you can actually, at the end of the cycle, you can see a big cord stuck on the on that uh, anterior leaflet um, uh, on, the, uh, on the anterior side uh, arm of the clip. This is a good example of when you're stuck and you do not want to say, I'm close enough and close the clip uh, because you're gonna end up rupturing something or stuck or, and you're gonna have a lousy result because it's gonna distort the valve. So, um, you know, this is what I did. So, uh, the, you know, the, I got to get this off here. I can't do that. Uh, anyway, so um, I, I was able to come off. You know, this is for a second clip. You you know, when you have a when you're trying to put a second clip next to a, a first clip, there is some risk of interaction between the two clips or with cords. So you just have to be really careful and line it up by fluoroscopy to make sure they're truly perpendicular. They're not coming in at an angle with each other. They're they're truly straight up and down with each other and that they match. And that's the nice thing about using fluoroscopy for the second clip. And, and if they do become uh, entrained or, 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 or interact or stuck together, um, you, you need to try to pull them apart. And let's say, let's say the, the, the clip on the, on the left is, uh, is, is, is stuck. What you can do is, um, is have the patient um, take a big inspiration, have anesthesia make the patient, uh, Take, patient take a big inspiration if you're on the lateral side of your first clip, and that'll move the clip lateral. Or you can do expiration, that'll move the clip medial, because when you inspire and expire, that moves the diaphragm, which moves the heart up and down, and your clip is stationary. So when you take a big inspiration, that moves the clip uh, relative to the mitral valve medial. And if you take a big, uh, uh, I'm sorry, if you move, take a big expiration, it moves it expiration moves the diaphragm up. So it moves the clip medial compared to the annulus. And if you take a big ex, uh, inspiration, it moves it lateral compared to the annulus. So you can use breathing to move things if you're, if you're stuck to pull things apart. And then you use your standard techniques uh, by inverting the clip and, and just trying to get off. Uh, and that's, that's how you do that. So um, here, uh, you know, I, I was at first interacting as I showed you. And now I've, I've moved it a little more medial compared to the first clip and I was able to come up. And now you see the difference. The, uh, the, the, the clip is pulled up and the leaflet arms, uh, the, the leaflets are, are laying nicely on the surface of the clip and I've closed the grippers and we have a much better result. Uh, so uh, another kind of chordal entanglement that's happened to me a couple of times that you need to know about is, uh, is I think specific to or unique to uh, the long arm clips. So here is a, a, a big, long, ruptured posterior cord. Um, I, I made up the term frondulous. It's like frondulous. I don't know. Um, but at any rate, it's a big cord. And, uh, and it turns out that it can wrap around the, the, uh, the grippers and trap them in the upward position. So if you are ever um, using a long arm clip in a patient with a big, flopping, uh, ruptured cord, just know to be really careful because that cord can wrap around the uh, the gripper elements and trap them in the up position. And you'll know that because you'll try to drop your grippers and you can't drop your grippers. Uh, that's a problem. Um, in this case, I was able to avulse the the um, the, uh, the cord and uh, and take out the clip and you can see uh, the cord wrapped around the, the shaft. Uh, this is pretty uncommon, but you just need to know about it. So then I, uh, you know, there's now a much shorter cord and, uh, you know, I put a clip in, two clips in and got a nice result. So it's salvageable, but sometimes you can truly be stuck. Um, and, uh, and if you ever have a very flail um, leaflet, uh, that's hard to grasp. And you probably all know the tricks to do this, but if you pull up, you're not gonna be able to drop your grippers over both the posterior and anterior leaflets here simultaneously. How do you do that? How do you uh, manage that? Some people have, have uh, proposed rapid pacing. I, I think rapid pacing just makes things go faster. Uh, it doesn't really do anything to grasping. But the one thing that you can do is give uh, through a central line, 12 milligrams of adenosine. So here it is in position. We've given adenosine and we're gonna wait for it, wait for it. It causes a systole, which locks the leaflet in the diastolic position. And then your gripper comes over and you can see it. So it's pretty cool. You can you can do that for flails, whether you caused them or they're were, they were pre-existing and nice result uh, with that. Um, single leaflet detachment, I've had that. It is much less common with independent grasping uh, because you can now be a lot more sure 
uh, of what you're doing. But here's an, a case that I did. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say during a, a, a advanced imaging teaching course when uh, they got their 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 money for their for their site visit because they watched me do something really stupid. And uh, and I got a single leaflet detachment because I wasn't paying close enough attention to insertion of the posterior leaflet. And uh, you can see that right here. That posterior leaflet is really not well engaged, uh, and and we should have known better. So the, the key things to make sure of that is if you're not sure, you're not absolutely sure, then open the clip and raise a gripper. And you know this is in the old days before we th this case is before we had independent grasping. But now with independent grasping, open it up and then re you know open open your leaflet in question, which is typically the posterior leaflet. Sock it in a little deeper and then drop your gripper. Uh, if it if you're worried about it coming out, that's the wrong answer. If you think it's going to come out, then it's going to come out. You need to prove that it's going to stay where it is when you open the clip. So don't uh, don't hesitate. And uh, and you can also tell whether you've got good grasping because you'll have on transgastric or on uh, on a on a four, 3D uh, imaging, you'll get a nice bow tie, and that's important. So how do you fix it if you have a single leaflet detachment? Um, it's not very much fun. But um, yeah, it, you know, you, I guess you can go to the OR, um, but if, um, but a lot of times, most, about at least half the time you could salvage your situation, uh, especially because a lot of these patients aren't good surgical candidates, by, um, by putting clips at least on one side, but typically on both sides. So it's a little challenging because your, your um, single leaflet detachment uh, clip is moving all over the place. So you just come very carefully, come perpendicular, you know, as if you're grasping your first time. And here you can see that clip is, uh, the first clip comes in, it grasps leaflets, and now the, the part, the single leaflet detachment clip is laying sideways. And then you uh, come in, and so we've stabilized that first clip. It's not flopping all over the place, but we obviously still have a lot of MR. And now we're gonna put a second clip on the other side. Uh, and again, it has to straddle it as close as you can without interacting, um, and, and that's just trial and error. And, uh, you know, not, not my best day, but at least we salvaged the situation. Um, and then clip-induced mitral stenosis should be very uncommon. And in the, in the G4 registry, even patients who are at risk for uh, mitral stenosis uh, had really good outcomes and very uncommon to have mitral stenosis. But it, you know, if you try hard enough, you can cause it and if you do the wrong patient. So who's going to have the problems with, with stenosis? Small mitral valve orifice area and patients with, with uh, a lot of MAC. Um, in general, avoid gradients greater than six. The only time I've ever caused mitral stenosis during a, a procedure was in that situation where I wasn't paying attention uh, close enough and I and the patient was both hypotensive and bradycardic, uh, unnaturally so, and, uh, and we underestimated the degree of, of stenosis uh, because stenosis is a problem to fix. You can't fix it once you have it. So in general, I'll accept a gradient of at least you know, six or less I'll take in most patients especially because most of these patients are relatively sedentary. Um, and also note that if you suddenly get bad gradients when you don't think you should have a gradient, you've probably pinwheeled or distorted the valve in some way. And again, check your arm angles and regrasp uh, in a different way. Um, lastly, deployment issues with the lock line. So I've, I've never done this. I've, I know people who've done it and I know that it can be done. So when you're deploying your clip and you're pulling your lock line, you want to make absolutely sure that you floss it and that there's no knot and there's no uh, interaction because once you pull a knot into the system, it can get stuck and you'll not and you won't be able to get your 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 clip released. Um, if you know if that happens to you, you'll know because it'll you'll, you're pulling the lock line and it stops. And if you can't get it to go further, you probably pulled in a knot. And if that happens, you need to verify your your um, your clip arm angles. If it can open, then you open it and you remove it. If it um, if it's if it's truly locked and it's stuck uh, and you can see the knot, then you start breaking down your device and using a mosquito clamp, you uh, you try to pull it out. And if you and if you can't, then you have to try to just remove the whole system carefully over the non knotted line and pull it out. Um, and your and your representatives will help you figure that out if God forbid you do it. So in conclusion, uh, complications associated with mit mitral clip are uncommon. Um, I've done, you know, I've been doing this for 18 years and I can count on maybe one hand, two hands, the number of really significant complications I've ever had. Um, and, you know, with planning and awareness, most of these things can be avoided. Teamwork and communication with the imager is essential. I have a constant dialogue with my imager. My imager is 60% of my team. And careful transeptal technique 
arm alignment and grasping are, are, are the, the key to procedural free complications, uh, free of complications. So with that, I'll stop and I'll turn it over to Neil and then we can make it a little more interactive moving from here. That was great. And, uh, you know, for the fellows, I think it was kind of nice to have a one-on-one of kind of what complications that you could expect and how to get yourself out of those situations. So our goal here is to show that, you know, mitral clips are really, it's it's commonly done. It's it's a very safe procedure, but there are times um, when you're going to get into sticky situations. And uh, our hope is that you can hopefully avoid those situations and learn from our experiences. So I have two cases and, you know, Mike, feel free to jump in because I think, you know, it's going to be helpful to have a little bit of discussion here. And so this, this is an 89 year old elderly female, severe MR, and she has atrial fibrillation and has atrial functional mitral regurgitation, you know, relatively low coaptation reserve. And, uh, and she is uh, obviously symptomatic from this mitral regurgitation. So we brought her in for a mitral valve clip. We placed a, um, a uh, NTW. Uh, as our first initial clip, and we placed that at the lateral aspect of A2P2, but we noticed um, uh, that the, or actually right at A2P2, but we noticed in the lateral jet that was persistent. You know, we had a, you know, just like anytime we have mitral clip, we kind of look and say, well, how aggressive should we be with MR reduction? And I think your goal should be in general to get to trace to, MR, trace to mild MR if you possibly can. This is an example where we had two plus residual mitral regurgitation, pulmonary veins that still had some element of blunting. And uh, even though she was out, the patient was elderly, we thought she was relatively functional. So that we should, so our feeling was that we should be a little bit more aggressive and put a second more second clip in. So we did that and we put a second clip just um, lateral to the existing clip. And we had trace to mild mitral regurgitation. So, you know, Mike, I mean, looking at this, I mean, would you have gone with a different clip strategy or would you have left it with the original uh, result that I had with two plus? So, you know, I think um, it is important to try to get the best result you can, but sometimes the enemy of, of good is, is perfect. Um, in general, atrial functional is hard. Um, and I, it took me a long time to even understand what it was. And I think we've all come to understand better. Uh, but you're right. It's that it's that lack of of coaptation. So it looks like it should be really graspable, but because uh, the annulus is enlarged and the leaflets are, are are pulled flat, there's just no way to like there isn't that give when you grab the leaflets to pull them together. I found you know I thought that uh, long arm clips were going to be a problem for atrial functional MR because you're going to put so much tension to the base of leaflets. But I found a lot of times that that it's really hard to grasp leaflets at all with short arm clips, and I've I've pretty much used uniformly long arm clips for atrial functional MR, and I haven't injured the leaflets uh, thus far, knock on my desk. Um, so, uh, you know, um, that, that's, that's all I got to say about atrial functional MR. I think, you know, so far, you, I, I can't, you know, you've done great work so far. Yeah. Well, you know, and I think one thing I'll add to that is with atrial functional MR, especially with the low coaptation reserve, is doing the doing it 3D after your grip arms are down to make sure that you are perpendicular line of coaptation and you are where you need to be. I think it's even more important in an atrial functional MR because those are the valves given the low coaptation reserve that we can cause a little bit of pinwheeling some working and can end up with these jets that have geometry that are, it's a little bit different than what we started with. And, and I think one of the things that was take home to the fellows that if your jet looks different than the geometry that you started with after you put the clip on it, you need to move, think about, think about your orientation. And I think that's what you're getting. So the, the concept that it took me a long time to understand is atrial functional MR, because maybe everybody knows this already, but I didn't, is that, you know, functional MR is the left ventricle is not normal and your posterior leaflet's tethered. But you have you have the ability to pull the leaflets together. Atrial functional MR is generally the LV function is good, the atrium is enlarged, and the leaflets are, are are flattened and they don't come together perfectly well. And exactly like you said, if you are off, if your clip is sideways and you pull it together, you don't have a lot of there's not a lot of slack to pull it together. So if you're off, then you're gonna much more easily pinwheel. So it you know it's always critically important to be perpendicular line of coaptation. But this is a, a situation where it's even more important to get exactly, I agree. Yeah. So at this point, you know, we were checking our interrogations, we're checking our pulmonary veins. We were excited about the fact that we got this patient down to trace MR. And when we we're looking at the pulmonary veins, we noticed that there was reversal. And so we went back and, and, and looked at the valve and there was a new jet that was present that was not seen on the prior frame. 
And so at that point, you know, the concern is that, well, did the, did the valve torque, did the leaflet tear, did we fray leaflet, did we have, an, did we have a, a single leaflet detachment? And at that point, the, the first thing I did was we, we, we interrogated on color, but then I said, well, let's try to remove, let's, let's, let's obviously undo what we just did, bring the clip back into the atrium and, and figure out what we're doing. So as you can see here, the, 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 as Mike said, you have a jet where you should not have a jet and color is not respecting the leaflet. And what you see in the last frame here is, is on, two, on uh, 2D is that there's a small perforation of that leaflet. And that's where that's where you had significant mitral regurgitation. So there was probably some undue tension that was on the leaflets. And as Mike's talked about, is that when you're putting that clip on there as you're closing, you should be giving back. Um, clearly, we must have not, we must have either had too much leaflet and too much tension on these leaflets. And this is a really rare complication that I think I've only seen one other time um, in in cases. But it's something that that tells us that you know, especially in although this was a atrial functional result, these are calcified leaflets. And we do have to be uh, mindful of saying, well, what was was the you know was the enemy of perfection, um, you know, enemy of good is perfection. And I think that's clearly what happened here. So um, you know, I think we talked a little bit about that. But as far as the strategy here, um, you know, Mike, what would you have done? Would you have? Um, yeah, I think clearly the, the clip the clip needed to come out. But there, we did have a discussion in the lab if we should try to grasp, use a bigger clip and try to grasp. Uh, more of the base of, of, of the leaflet. And the decision we made obviously was not to do that because the concerns that we could make this perforation a whole lot worse and potentially make this patient from a hemodynamically stable severe MR patient to an unstable patient. But I, I, I would imagine your, your approach may be the same, but let's, maybe you can tell us. Yeah, I've actually been in the exact same situation. And I thought like, is there a way I could take a clip, a clip and cover that perforation? But ultimately I didn't, have the intestinal fortitude to try it. I think I read a, a report somewhere in Jack International or someplace like that where somebody did that maybe in, outside the US. But I, I was always worried just like you were that um, that I would just continue to, to injure the leaflet. And so I've never done that. And, um, and I've just, you know, uh, fortunately those patients were hemodynamically stable and I, I didn't make them better, but I didn't make them, uh, you know, worse. Um, it, it's, you know, it's a problem. Yeah. And should we have left the clip in place or was it the right thing to do to take it out? I have, um, I have left it in, but um, you're right. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the right answer is. I think that if you make a hole, whether you leave the clip in or take it out, it's a hole. I guess you could make an argument that, um, that the tensions will might make it continue to rip. I, I, mm -hmm. uh, but I just don't know. Uh, it's more, mostly theoretical. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think in, in the role of, you know, hemodynamic instability, if this patient had become unstable, I think this is where you really need to be thinking about hemodynamic support. And again, when you see a jet like this, and for the fellows, and, and you're in a place where your patient's still stable, um, you know, again, quit while you're ahead. Uh, and that's what we did here. We stopped here, we took the patient off the table. And fortunately, the patient, um, you know, has, uh, over the last six months has been able to do satisfactorily with medical management, uh, but she's old, frail. She's not a surgical candidate. Um, but you know, I, I I do think that if we had kept going, trying to put a second clip or trying to regrasp this, that we would have injured the leaflet more and caused a hemodynamically unstable situation here. So, all right, and uh, let's go to our next case here. So, so this is an 81 year old female with severe MR. She's got a P1. Uh, prolapse or uh, prolapse flail. And you can see here with torrential mitral regurgitation that is anteriorly directed. And if you in looking at um, 2D here, you can see that there's plenty of, um, the leaflets are, have plenty of length for an XTW and would have been my clip of choice here. So we went in and used, to, initially I went in with the strategy of potentially trying to put two clips here, but I put one clip there, um, you know, had a little bit more mobility there posteriorly on that flail. But anteriorly, I, from what I could tell, looked like the anterior leaflet was relatively stable. Um, and, you know, I was down a trace to mild. And, you know, again, we talk about perfection being the enemy of good. And so we, we had a discussion. Should we put a second clip here? Should we leave this result? Uh, Mike, what would you have done in your lab? I, I mean, it looks pretty good. So the, the one, the, the only, you know, uh, hindsight's twenty twenty, And I know you're showing cases that, that may have been challenging. So I'm colored by that. Yeah. But, um, but in patients who've got really redundant, um, uh, you know, broad jets, uh, if you have enough 
valve area. Sometimes uh, people will put a second clip just to stabilize the result because um, it, I mean, it may theoretically improve the durability of the procedure. You know, if you've got leaflet that's all over the place that's moving up and down and you put one clip and you, you've affected MR reduction, but you've got a whole bunch of still motion, it may rock and it may it may cause a progressive uh, of, uh, progressive injury to the leaflet. So some people will put a second clip just to stabilize it. Uh, um, but, you know, um, I think you have to judge every case uh, individually. And uh, there's a lot of mobility on that leaflet, uh, but it's if you've got a good result, it's hard to hard to argue with a good result. Yeah. I guess in hindsight is 2020, knowing that you're going to show me that maybe it didn't go perfect, but I guess I would put a second clip, but I'm not. The other consideration we had was that the, the second clip would have gone um, closer to the commissure and gone lateral to this clip. So the concern was that, well, could we have gotten stuck in the cordate? Or the other option, could we, should we move this more, this first clip more laterally and then put a second clip more medial to that to stabilize people? Originally, that was our strategy, but we we, we looked at this result and said, well, it's a hard, we had a hard time chasing this down. And so, we, so the patient goes to the uh, to the uh, post-op recovery area. Patient's do, re, initially doing well. Our uh, sonographer uh, texts me and says, "You might want to come take a look at this echo before 5 p.m." So we look at the we look at the echo. We see that there's significant mitral regurgitation. Of course, we brought her back to the lab, and this is what we found. And we found that there was interest, interestingly an anterior SLDA. Um, and, was, and with the clip, um, and these are real fun because these are, the clip is moving now violently and it, it is, and, and now you have a, a pendulum on a leaflet here um, that is closer to the commissure. So um, what, in retrospect, what happened, if you look, is that the anterior leaflet probably was folded over and we probably missed the fact that there was um, some knuckling of the leaflet. And ideally when you're grasping the leaflet, you want to have the leaflet like a piece of paper and just grab the piece of paper. You don't want to knuckle because those tend to slip and come out. And I, and, and I think, and interestingly, that's the one that, um, that we had the SLD on, not the posterior one, which had the increased mobility. So at this point, you know, our options were, you know, we had, again, we had a stable patient were to go to surgery or try to stabilize this with, um, with uh, additional mitral valve clips. So at this point, uh, you know, our, our strategy was now to go back to the uh, lateral aspect of, of uh, P1 and to put a clip there closer to the commissure. And that was a clip, of course, that we were anxious to put in, in to begin with. Uh, that went relatively well in terms of trying to put the clip there. However, what we noticed is that the, uh, that the uh, leaf, the clip that was existing on the posterior leaflet was now a huge pendulum. So there was significant mitral regurgitation. So we know we had to put another clip on the other side of that clip. Um, and we did put another clip next to it and another XT and uh, were able to stabilize that. And again, we could have started with a clip on the medial side of that P1 clip, but we would decide to go lateral because the main index pathology was was P1. So we went lateral to it to start with. And then we put one next to it. Unfortunately, we were never able to trap this um, clip on the ventricle. And ideally when you're, when you're um, trying to salvage an SLDA, you'd like to have the clip in the ventricular position and have both clips next to it and, and, and hopefully have some element of co-optation that can go from torrential MR to even, you know, three to four plus MR. Um, at this point, unfortunately, we were not able to do that. And we were able to get to a solid mod up to severe. And, you know, this leaf, this, 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 uh, clip that was remaining in the atrial position, we could not trap that down on the ventricular side. Um, Ultimately, this patient uh, did not do well, um, and she ended up requiring a mitral valve replacement and at, thereafter did well. Uh, but in the mitral valve replacement was not emergent. She needed this several weeks later. So we gave her some time, but she got, had a couple of admissions for congestive heart failure, and she was in her, uh, in her young 80s. So, we, uh, so she was able to go through surgery and to this day is still doing relatively well. Um, so I guess, Mike, you know, you and I talked about the two-clip strategy, and it sounds like, you know, I, I think in, in general in flails, uh, that is probably what you want to do. Um, and I think that we both agree that the anterior leaflet could have been better optimized. And if we go back a few images here, you can see that this anterior leaflet is a little bit on the longer side. Here we go. Okay. One more.
So the anterior leaflet was actually was a relatively long leaflet. And what we noticed in one of the images going back is that the anterior leaflet looked a lot shorter after we clipped it. And, and there was no way that we could have had that much tissue inside the clip. And so we should have, that should have been our first signal that, that there was some neckling going on with the leaflet. So you can see here that the anterior leaflet looks relatively long and looks almost as long as the posterior leaflet. So when we went and put the clip in, in this particular view, we should have noticed that that anterior leaflet looked was was stable, but also a lot shorter than we would have expected it to be, even for an XTW. So that should have been our first uh, first suggestion that there was some element of knuckling there. Um, any closing thoughts here, Mike? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the the challenge. Like, um, if you've not ever had an SLDA, then you haven't done enough cases. It, it's going to happen to you someday. It's just fortunately, it's only about like one to two percent of cases. So the, the best way to avoid it is much less common now that we can do independent grasping because with independent grasping, you know, you should be, if you're, if you have any question about your grasp, you should raise your grippers and optimize or double check. And if, if you're concerned, you may have, you know, a knuckle or it's not truly flat, then raise your grippers and be sure. In modern times with the ability to, to do single, you know, single leaflet optimization, uh, the, the main problem is going to be like you just your imager can't see the leaflet. Uh, you know, you're, you've got shadowing. And, and because if you can see, then you shouldn't miss because you can raise the grippers and optimize now. But 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 there are situations where you can't see and you got to ask your imager to go from the LV outflow track view to the to the zero degree and 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 get facile with the with the L knob on your on your probe and move the esophagus. That's what the L knob does. It, it shifts the esophagus to a different position. And again, I'm like pretending I'm a, a T guy. I can't do T, but but um, but I know L knob, and that's like that can change the angle of incination uh, so that you can um, get things out of the way. Sometimes, if the shaft of the guide is is really uh, um, uh, shadowing and you just can't see, sometimes you can change. You know, if maybe you'd put some plus on it, maybe you take the plus off. Uh, you have to try to do things so you can see. The key thing is, if you're if you're if you can't see and you're taking a leap of faith, that's when you're going to get into trouble. So it's with modern day imaging and modern day techniques and and the current G4 system. If you can see, you, you, it should be very rare to have an SLDA. Yeah. So Mike, I'm sure you know. I'm sure the fellows have a ton of questions, but one I think. I'm sure the fellows are thinking actually goes back to your first slide. If you want to, if you want to go back to um, your screen share uh, sure. for perforations, because how do we do, how, what would you recommend, especially when the fellows are learning transeptal or relatively new to transeptal to avoid uh, a, a perforation with transeptal, obviously putting a wire up using a bailiff system, using uh, a modern technology, but, but what is it about the relation to Waterston's group and going posterior that could potentially cause that complication as well? Yeah, so the, the, the key thing is first is to visualize, and I, I guess I can share screen um, with, uh, with mine here and uh, go back. Um, the, the key thing with, uh, for me is first, I mean, it's some basic transeptal stuff. Uh, the first transeptal complication I ever had was, or, you know, I didn't learn transeptal during fellowship, I learned it on the job, which is not fun. And, um, and this was back in 2004. And um, and I moved the guide upward without the wire. Like nobody would do that, but I did that. And uh, and I ended up going out the right atrial appendage. Um, uh, and I learned what the right atrial appendage was on that day too. Um, so uh, don't move the guide, uh, don't move your catheter up without a wire. Um, and then most importantly, that Watterson's groove concept is if you are too posterior, you can exit the posterior uh, wall of the right atrium and then skewer the um, posterior portion of the left atrium and end up back in the left atrium and not realize that you've exited from that groove. It's like, they call it skewering the butt cheeks. And, uh, and at the end of the case, you pull your guide back and suddenly you've got a massive effusion uh, and the patient gets super sick because, uh, because you didn't realize that you had exited and re-entered in that, in that, in that fold uh, between, the, between the two uh, atria, the Watterson's groove. So the key thing is to only stick the thin part of the septum. If it's getting thick on the posterior portion, don't stick there because there's some risk that you could enter a Waterston's groove. That, and that's the key. And one of the suggestions to the fellows is, you know, if you are concerned that you may have stuck there or that you may have perf you may have that, uh, that, that may be an issue, uh, before you pull the guide back, put a wire across, right? You can put a 10 French sheath 
go to wire, put a J wire across, bring your sheath back. And at least at that point, you have ability to access that. But if you've already pulled your sheath back, uh, it's going to be really difficult to go through and through and try to get through there in an urban situation. Maybe that, that sheath may be tamponading off that any, any potential uh, perforation. And remember, if you um, if you want to put a wire into your into your guide, um, put a, put like a six French or an eight French sheath into the hemostatic valve first, and then use that because the hemostatic valve that comes with you know that comes as part of the guide is not is not so good. If you just put a wire through it, it'll just entrain air. So um, so put it put a sheath like a six or eight French sheath first, and then use that to put your wire through. Yeah. All right, it, and. Uh, Let's see, where are we? We're get, well, we have like uh, at least 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. Let's see if I've got my chat function. I'm Don't stop see, here. see here. Yeah, there were a few questions that there came up in the chat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and just as, I don't know if everybody can see them, there were some questions here. Um, what about uh, borderline gradients when the heart rate is, is fast? Do you recommend um, lowering the heart rate uh, so I do, I, you know, I, I would give the patient a, you know, if they're tachycardic, I would give them a beta blocker, but the other way to see other than a measured gradient, if a patient is tachycardic and you're like, I don't believe that gradient is, is you can, um, you know, in, in transgastric or a good 3d, uh, measure the two residual orifices, the medial orifice and the lateral orifice and add them up and, um, and, and get a sense of the true mitral valve orifice area. It's not perfect, but if you've got like a gradient, but it's like a big, uh, you know, big residual orifice, orify, orify, um, and, uh, and, and you don't think you've just ordered the valve, then that may be of some reassurance. But I would, in general, try to lower the heart rate. Um, that's the way I'd look at that. Yeah. And the other question is actually a really good question from Akash about, uh, you know, evaluating MR under general anesthesia, because we see this all the time, right? Especially in functional cases where the MR um, that's done with fentanyl and Versed. Uh, on board, you know, pa patients may be a little bit more hydrated, um, and uh, and their MR looks different when they come in for mitral clip day, right? So I think again, it's 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 part of it's trusting your pre-procedure imaging, um, but uh, you know, I think uh, I think Mike's uh, comment on that is that you know, volume challenge there, bump up the do what you need to do the basic and strict, and bump up those pressures so you can st so because it's important to know exactly where that jet's coming from, making sure that you're hitting the index pathology. So it's not a matter of uh, well, the severity, you should establish that before you come to the lab, uh, but certainly it's more so to make sure that you are not being misled after you put a clip that you clip the wrong segment of the valve. And I'd say, you know, the most, uh, honestly, the most common complication in mitral clip is just not, you know, is not getting the MR reduction that you wanted to. I, I think of that as a complication. Um, it, you know, compared to TAVR, compared to many other procedures, it's just way safer. Um, and, um, and so, uh, you know, when I when I think about failure with with TAVR, I think of an embolized valve or a ruptured annulus or some you know or a big pericardial fusion or some catastrophe, which are rare but they can happen. Whereas in clip, like most of the time, those things don't happen. Uh, um, you know, the the worst thing that happens for most mitral clip patients is you intend to get a good MR reduction and you get moderate MR reduction. And 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 the key thing is to not be satisfied to really you know, with current gen, with G4 technology, um, you know, if you spend the time to make sure your arms are truly perpendicular, that you don't uh, entrain a cord and that you're stuck on a cord thinking that you've got a good grasp and you don't distort the leaflets and you put the clips, you know, where the, where the, the PISA is and, and, and then add a second clip if you need a second clip carefully and thoughtfully, you should really get one plus or less MR, um, you know, uh, at least 90% of the time in straightforward anatomy and probably in more complex anatomy, you should get one plus or better MR in at least 80%, you know, 75, 80% of patients. Um, and, and that's what the data from the G4 registry shows. And that's what our own data um, show. So don't be satisfied with two plus. Two plus is no longer uh, good enough. That, you know, in the old days, two plus was good enough. That's not good enough anymore. I'm not happy with two plus. I'm happy with one plus. All right. So, what's the worst thing that's ever happened to you during mitral clip, Neil? Was that that SLPA? Other than the two cases, other than the two cases that I showed you, I think uh, you know we had an, you know we had an air embolism and we had to go back and we had to go in and we had to, we had to uh, remove it. Um, uh, 
Uh, we do at this point, you know, you've done hundreds of clips and, um, you know, and probably some of the most in the country at this point, when you're talking to your patients, how do you approach that conversation and saying, you know, it's going to go well, but here's the risks, you know, how, to what extent now, um, do we, you know, re, re, read the riot act compared to five or seven years ago when the technology was relatively new? Yeah. I mean, I try to, um, uh, look at my own experience and then look at the data. Uh, from from the registries and 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 from coapt and uh, you know I say look uh, the risk of a major complication is probably one percent or less um, and that's pretty good uh, and that that means there are a whole bunch of things that are less than one percent that add up to one percent so I think that's pretty satisfying and then I say you know the the downside to clip is that it's not uniformly going to get you zero MR you're always going to have a little bit of MR. But that's okay. Most patients do really well if they have one plus or less MR. And that's what we're going to shoot for. We don't always get it, but we're going to try to. But the good news is most of the time, uh, we're going to make you better and, and rarely are we going to make you worse. And so I, I think that's the way to, to look at it. And, and patients, I think, as long as you're honest and transparent with them about, about it, uh, that, that usually goes well. And I'm also going to tell them if their anatomy is looks really complex and I'm not sure how it's going to go. Then I'll tell them, you know, we're going to try our best and, and, and it is what it is. I think, like I said, setting expectations of the patient, you know, the A2P2s, I think those are the ones where I feel like very confident. And if there's long leaflets and, you know, at the medial lateral portions of the valve, absolutely. But I think telling, I think setting the expectation of the patient, what to expect, um, especially if they have challenging anatomy um, is, is, I think it's helpful for them to, to know that ahead of time. I think the places where you know you're going to struggle um, are patients with very calcified cords. Those are rough because the calcified cords are, first, they, they're more likely to um, interact with the clip to get the clip stuck. There's something about the calcium that, that, that grabs, the, grabs the clip. And also, it makes the, the leaflets less pliable. They get kind of fixed down and you can't pull them up. So I've had a lot more experience of, of uh, getting stuck on cords. Uh, and uh, in patients who've got calcified cords. So early in your experience, you should probably avoid um, calcified cords. And if you, if you ever do do them, just be careful. I would be less likely to use long arm clips. I would make sure that I open the clip right underneath the leaflets. I don't want to get deep into the, into the, uh, into the ventricle. The other uh, place that, that you're going to get frustrated is if you have a posterior leaflet that's really tethered, not like a little tethered, but like fixed, you're not going to pull that up. Uh, and you're, you know, the industry person you work with will help you sort of understand the difference. But if you've got a, you know, if you've got secondary MR and the, the posterior leaflet's moving, but it's not moving all the way, is different than a posterior leaflet that's kind of stuck uh, and that you're not going to be able to pull that up. So those are, that's another sort of situation just to where the anatomy is not going to, you know, not every anatomy is good for clip and, and nor is every anatomy good for tavern. What do you think your workhorse clip is at this point? For me, it's the NTW. That's the one I use most. Even for atrial function, there's plenty of, uh, plenty of leaflet. Uh, I tend to go with the shorter clips. And if I'm dealing with the flail uh, anatomy or with very long leaflets with good coaptation uh, reserve, then I will go with an XT uh, or XTW. W what's your approach in general? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I know people who are, you know, well-known in, uh, in, the, in the community who use XTW like all the time, but I actually um, have found that the NTW is, is more of a workhorse that long arm clips can um, lead to, can lead to more, you know, you just have to be more careful with them because they're long. So you can distort the leaf, you know, distort the leaflets easier. And, um, and also, especially if, if you're not, if you don't have a lot of height, if you're struggling for height and you've done all your maneuvers, you've, you've um, put a knob on and posterior torqued and, and, and tried to gain as much height as you can. If you're really close to the annulus, uh, uh, it's going to be much harder to get a long arm clip out if you if you go in and, and you want to come back out. So sure. um, so NTW I think is the workhorse, but XTW is a one is a good device and is going to be uh, much more uh, re, you know you're going to get more leaflet in. So if you want a one and done and your anatomy is pretty especially for secondary MR where it's pretty straightforward anatomy that one that putting one XTW and getting that thing down to trace is extremely satisfying. But I, but I agree with you. I, I'm, you know, I, I probably at least 60% NTW and, and the, and the, uh, the non wide clips, I, I, I don't think I'll ever use another XT again in my life. Uh, although there are some people do, uh, and I, and I use NTs only for places where I'm really concerned about mitral valve orifice area. And that's my single clip and that's my one and done. 
or as a touch up clip, uh, uh, you know, after my first clip and, and I'm concerned about, about residual mitral valve orifice area. Wish there were more opportunities for you to tell us your experience. Cause I, I, you know, when we bring people in uh, to watch us, I learn as much from them as I teach uh, because it's a community and a group experience uh, and it's shared learning. Um, and I, I very much, very important, listen to your reps. Uh, um, I've done a lot of clips in my career, but not nearly as many as my reps uh, who stand next to me um, and, because they do it every day, all day long. And so they, they can be invaluable. So um, uh, I try to be humble and listen to everyone around me and, and make sure your imager is a integral part of your conversation. They need to be empowered because they're, they're critically important. Yeah. Well, we are thrilled for this program. This was fantastic. Thank you both so much for sharing. And uh, Dr. Rinaldi and Dr. Duella, we certainly will take you up on your offer and your sentiment about educating. And we look okay. forward to doing more with you uh, with this community. So what we'll do now is we'll just share a few final housekeeping things. And um, the first thing that we wanna share is that we definitely wanna do this all again. We have June 20th scheduled for our next program where the uh, focus of that conversation will be around the implanter and the imager. So really that communication, that partnership and some tips and opportunities you have and really developing and cultivating that strong partnership within your programs. Ooh, and Dr. Hamid is awesome. I, I, um, also Dr. Kappel is awesome, but I, I, I just got to know her uh, at another course and she is, the bomb. Woo <laughs> Thank you for that. So guys, make sure you come back so you can definitely learn and check that out. And then also we just ask that in order for us to continuously improve, your feedback is phenomenally important. So if you could take your cell phone and put your uh, camera up to the QR code, it'll bring up a survey where we really ask for you to, if you don't mind doing that now, give us some feedback on what you heard tonight. So with that, if there are no other questions from the chat and feel free, even if later you have questions to come back to this platform to ask them, we will communicate with Dr. Rinaldi and Dr. Giwala to get those questions to them and get you an answer. We really thank you for this opportunity to um, educate you and partner with these phenomenal faculty members. And we look forward to doing it again. Have a great night. And thank you both again, Dr. Rinaldi and Dr. Giwala. You did a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.